Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Moments Orthodox Presbyterian Church in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just a couple of announcements. One is that uh, Sunday school will be resuming today, though we will not have refreshments this week. Uh, my family and I will be on vacation this coming week. We uh, will welcome Mr. Nate Blerschel for the pulpit on next Sunday, and uh, Reverend Norm DeYoung will fill the pulpit for our Thanksgiving Day service, which is Thursday at 9.30 a.m. There's also a, uh, an update from Kylie Bronke. You can uh, read that also in the bulletin. Uh, she is on location uh, in Ghana. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of the living God with silent prayer. Psalm 93. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and is armed with strength. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be present in our midst this morning. Please turn with me to number 366 in the hymnal. 366, we'll sing the first five verses of 366.
For our encouragement in Christian living, we come to Article 22 of the Belgic Confession, which treats of justification. There's two articles that treat of justification in the Belgic Confession. This is the first one. And it is talking about the full sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice. We don't need to add anything to it. To say anything other than that is to say that he's, his sacrifice is not sufficient for us. And that is actually a huge discouragement to us if Christ's sacrifice is not all we need. And it's also blasphemous. Sacrifice of the God-man must be sufficient for the forgiveness of our sins. That's why we, that's the ultimate reason why our works do not contribute to our justification, to our forgiveness, and to our right to eternal life, because Christ is sufficient. So this is Article 22. We believe that to attain the true knowledge of this great mystery, the Holy Spirit kindles in our hearts an upright faith, which embraces Jesus Christ with all his merits, appropriates him, and seeks nothing more besides him. For it must needs follow, either that all things which are requisite to our salvation are not in Jesus Christ, or if all things are in him, that then those who possess Jesus Christ through faith have complete salvation in him. Therefore, for anyone to assert that Christ is not sufficient, but that something more is required besides him, would be too gross a blasphemy. For hence it would follow that Christ was but half a savior. Therefore, we justly say with Paul that we are justified by faith alone, or by faith apart from works. However, to speak more clearly, we do not mean that faith itself justifies us, for it is only an instrument with which we embrace Christ our righteousness. But Jesus Christ, imputing to us all his merits, and so many holy works which he has done for us and in our stead, is our righteousness. And faith is an instrument that keeps us in communion with him in all his benefits, which, when they become ours, are more than sufficient to acquit us of our sins. Please turn with me to number 369, Shout for the Blessed Jesus Reigns. 369.
our expository reading, we come to Deuteronomy chapter 15. Two main ideas present themselves in this chapter. One is that of generosity. So there is a year for canceling debts. That is every seventh year. And it even addresses the possible uh, stinginess of somebody who might think, well, the seventh year's close, so I'm not going to lend uh, money to that person. And the text says to give generously and without a grudging heart. And the principle is you can't outgive God. God has been extraordinarily generous with his people, and so they are to be generous with each other. And then also with servants. The servants are to go free every seventh year as well, and they're not to go free with nothing, because their service has been worth much more than that of a hired hand, as it says in verse 18. So the principle here is of generosity, especially towards others in the body of Christ. And then also firstborn animals, the last part of the chapter here, is that those that are offered to the Lord must be without any kind of blot or blemish. And then also the blood is not to be eaten with the animal because you don't mix life with death. So this is the word of our God, Deuteronomy chapter 15. At the end of every seven years, we must cancel debts. This is how it is to be done. Every creditor shall cancel the loan he has made to his fellow Israelite. He shall not require payment from his fellow Israelite or brother, because the Lord's time for canceling debts has been proclaimed. You may require payment from a foreigner, but you must cancel any debt your brother owes you. However, there should be no poor among you, for in the land the Lord your God has given you to possess as your inheritance, he will richly bless you, if only you fully obey the Lord your God, and are careful to follow all these commands I am giving you today. For the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised, and you will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. You will rule over many nations, but none will rule over you. If there is a poor man among your brothers, in any of the towns of the land that the Lord your God has given you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward your poor brother. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend him whatever he needs. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for canceling debts, is near, so that you do not show ill will toward your needy brother and give him nothing. He may then appeal to the Lord against you, and you will be found guilty of sin. Give generously to him, and do so without a grudging heart. Then, because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work, and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your brothers and toward the poor and needy in your land. If a fellow Hebrew, a man or a woman, sells himself to you and serves you six years, in the seventh year you must let him go free. And when you release him, do not send him away empty-handed. Supply him liberally from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Give to him as the Lord your God has blessed you. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I give you this command today. But if your servant says to you, I do not want to leave you, because he loves you and your family and is well off with you, then take an awl and push it through his earlobe into the door, and he will become your servant for life. Do the same for your maidservant. Do not consider it a hardship to set your servant free, because his service to you these six years has been worth twice as much as that of a hired hand. And the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. Set apart for the Lord your God every firstborn male of your herds and flocks. Do not put the firstborn of your oxen to work, and do not shear the firstborn of your sheep. Every year, you and your family are to eat them in the presence of the Lord your God at the place he will choose. If an animal has a defect, is lame or blind, or has any serious flaw, you must not sacrifice it to the Lord your God. 
You are to eat it in your own towns. Both the ceremonially unclean and the clean may eat it as if it were gazelle or deer, but you must not eat the blood. Pour it out on the ground like water. Let us pray. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our triune God, we lift up your name on high today. We worship you for your many wonderful attributes, that you are infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, in your being, wisdom, knowledge, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. We thank you, Father, that these characteristics are on clear display in your creation, that in all your wisdom and creative ability, you spoke this world into existence. By the mere word of your power, you created a world that is beautiful for your servants to live in, for us to be thankful for, for us to lift up to you as your benevolence, as the evidence that you love your creation. And Father, it points us to our shame and guilt, for we were not thankful and did not give you praise and did not glorify your name. Father, in Adam and Eve, our first parents, we sinned against you. In our pride, we, did, we wanted the throne of the universe for ourselves. We made an alliance with Satan and broke our alliance with you. And so, Father, our, our hearts are guilty before you and our souls are corrupt by the presence of indwelling sin. And we sin all the time. But Father, we come before you with thanksgiving that the blood of Christ is fully sufficient so that our sins may be forgiven, so that we may have the right to eternal life, that we may have the new heavens and the new earth as our inheritance, as the hope that is reserved in heaven for us, uncorrupted and undefiled, where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves cannot break in and steal. We are thankful, Father, for this inheritance. We're thankful, Father, for the, the battle that you wage against evil in this world, and that you are not a God who is far off and who is only a witness to the things that happen on earth but you divinely direct all things so that they will turn to good. And so, Father, help us to make sense of this world. And when we cannot, that we rely on your wisdom, that all things are clear to you, the end from the beginning, and that this, the way the world is right now, that this is part of your plan, and it is a good plan, and it is for the good of all your people. And so, Father, help us to rely and rest on your wisdom, and not to rely on our own wisdom. We know, Father, that our wisdom messes things up. We know, Father, that our wisdom has huge holes in it and errors, and we are prone to wander we are prone to do foolish things. Father, we ask for you to give us the path of wisdom in the Holy Spirit so that in union with Jesus Christ, we may recognize how much better your plan is than ours. We pray, Father, as we come upon a week of thanksgiving, that we will see the things for which we shall be thankful that we will give thanks to you, and that we will mean it, that our hearts will not be hard, that we will not be ungenerous towards our fellow believers, that we will seek to serve, that we will seek to lay out our lives and pour them out as an offering before you. We thank you, Father, that you sent your Son, that he lived a perfect life, and accumulated all the merit needed for us to enter into eternal life. 
We thank you that that merit becomes ours in faith in the Lord Jesus, so that all our sins are forgiven. And we pray, Father, as we seek to live for you, that your Holy Spirit will indwell us, will help us to walk in the way you've called us to walk, will help us to run with endurance the race you set before us, will help us, Father, to run from evil, to run from temptation, to seek that way of escape that you have promised will always be there. We pray, Father, that you will bless your church, the, the bride of Christ, Zion, your holy hill. We pray, Father, for the truth to be the bedrock of your church. We thank you for the scriptures that you have revealed and given to your church. We thank you that they are the pillar and foundation of all that we do. We thank you that they are the only rule for faith and life. We thank you, Father, that you have given gifts to the church, that every Christian has them. We pray that you will help us to use them in the church to the glory of your name. We thank you for those who are called to be missionaries and to bring the word of God to those who have not heard it before. We thank you, Father, for those who go out and pray and preach the word of God. And we pray that you will anoint them with your Holy Spirit, that they will preach the truth of the scriptures as they point us to our Savior Jesus. We pray for the members of the church that you will grant them courage, strength, boldness, and the ability, Father, to show forth the love of Christ, that it may radiate out from us and be obvious to people outside our midst. We pray that you will bring people to our church, people in need of the saving work of Jesus Christ, and that they will see Jesus and meet with you here in our worship. We pray, Father, for those who are ill. We pray that you will bless them with increased health. We thank you for those who are getting healthy. And we pray, Father, you will continue that process. We pray, Father, that you will grant learning and teaching in the time of trial so that we may glorify your name always. And bless our worship, Father, that it may be according to the Spirit and in truth. We pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand with me and sing number 370, Revive Thy Work, O Lord, number 370.
Oh Lord God, as we come to consider, especially today, your kingdom and the King of Kings who rules it, we pray, Father, that you will help us to see your work, to see your finger, as it were, working in the world, so that it will be obvious to us, even when it seems obscured or faint, that you really are at work. May your Holy Spirit enlighten our hearts and minds in the truth of God's Word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn in the scriptures to Exodus chapter 8. We'll be looking at verses 16 through 19. And that's Exodus chapter 8, verses 16 through 19. Hear now God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the ground. And throughout the land of Egypt, the dust will become gnats. They did this, and when Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust of the ground, gnats came upon men and animals. All the dust throughout the land of Egypt became gnats. But when the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not. And the gnats were on men and animals. The magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not listen, just as the Lord had said. It's easy to ask in times like ours, what holds the world together? What's holding our lives together? Lots of people think it's their own talent and skill. That's what holds their lives together. But what happens when God takes away all our stability? What happens when our gifts for organization are insufficient? Shouldn't we ask at that time whether they ever were sufficient? Now I imagine, maybe, some Egyptians might have had thoughts like this cross their minds during this third plague. And why is that? Because Egyptians believed in a concept of order. They had a name for it. It was called Ma'at. And according to the doctrine of Ma'at, everything on earth existed in a balance. Pharaoh held the key to that balance, the key to Ma'at, in his own person. So as long as Pharaoh was on the throne, everything would be in balance. And of course, during these three plagues that we've seen so far, the idea of balance is being completely demolished. God has the power to take away the order humans try to inflict on creation. And he has the power to restore it. So the Egyptians are getting another very difficult lesson in theology. Several of their gods are under attack in this plague. Egyptians worshipped a god named Kepher. This god was the god of resurrection, and the symbol for Kepherer was a beetle, or a scarab. And this particular scarab had golden tints, was thought to resemble the sun. So the beetle was thought to be resurrected from the dust of the earth, and the beetle would go underground and then come back up again. That resembled what happened to the sun, since the sun goes you know, behind the earth and rises up on the other side, and the sun was thought to carry death during the nighttime, much like the scarab pushes along underground his little bundle of dung. And then the scarab also ate the larvae of mosquitoes and other small biting insects, and thus they helped control the comfort level of the Egyptians. All of that came to a sudden halt when the scarab wasn't enough. 
when God overcame the Egyptian god Kepra. Second god being attacked here is, the, is a god of the earth whose name was Gabe, G-E-B. God was claiming authority over the ground, the dust of the ground. Gabe was supposedly given authority over the whole earth by Nut, the goddess of the sky, which in Egyptian belief was the wife of Gabe, god of the earth. So by turning the earth into gnats, or the dust of the earth into gnats, God was saying Gabe had no power whatsoever. Of course, modern people worship the earth too. Sometimes they call it Mother Nature. Sometimes they are of the tree-hugging variety. Every time a tree is chopped down, it's equivalent to murder in their viewpoint. The recent movie Avatar is infused with this kind of earth worship. It's the modern worship of Gabe is very alive and well. But this play tells us that kind of worship is without any worth at all. It's a worship of the creation rather than the creator. So in this plague, Ma'at, Kepler, and Gabe are all completely worthless as gods to the Egyptians. But there's a, there's a fourth target in this plague too, and that's the priests themselves. The priests of Egypt had to be scrupulously clean and to bathe every day, shave every last bit of hair from themselves, precisely so that no infestations of lice or gnats or anything else would happen to them. So when they became infested with whatever animal this is in the plague, they could not perform at all the duties of the Egyptian religion. Now this plague starts with no warning whatsoever. The Pharaoh had lied to Moses and Aaron, lied to God. He said he would let the people of Israel go, but after relief came from the frogs, he did not let the people of Israel go. Therefore, this plague strikes without any warning whatsoever. And that's true of the third, the sixth, and the plagues. Aaron is told to strike the dust of the earth. And that's the very place where the scarab or beetle is thought to originate. So for the dust to turn into gnats or mosquitoes, whatever this critter is, would be a very great shock to Egyptian religion. And of course, the other connotation of the dust of the earth is that of human mortality. That's where human beings come from, too. Come from the dust of the earth. That the dust could turn into mosquitoes is more than a little bit humbling to humans. We come from the dust of the earth, so does the mosquito. Doesn't mean we're the same as mosquitoes or equivalent. But it is to say we need to remember our origins and that God can even use the stuff we are made of to bring justice and discipline and justice. We're not entirely sure what kind of creatures these gnats were, but if you think mosquitoes, you won't be far, far off. It's a small biting insect that can fly around, land on people, and make life absolutely miserable. If you go to Alaska in the summertime, you can see swarms of such mosquitoes. And those swarms contain so many mosquitoes that if they decide to attack a person, <coughs> They can actually kill that person by draining every last drop of blood from them. It must have been something as irritating as that during this plague. So when these swarms came over the Egyptians, it was an attack on their whole way of life, but especially their religion. And this plague also, like the last two, is retribution for the Egyptians' sins. Because the bricks that the Israelites made came from this same dust of the earth, and also with straw. And verse 17 is emphatic. All the dust in Egypt turned into mosquitoes. It doesn't mean all the soil, but at the very least, all of the loose dust was turned into mosquitoes. All of it. 
We're to see this plague then as a judgment upon Egypt for their slave driving of the Israelites. If all the dust is gone, Israel would not be able to make any more bricks. There simply wasn't any material left. Now the second plague is said to end. The frogs come to an end, they die, they sit in piles and they stink. But this plague is not said to have an end. Undoubtedly, the Nile eventually became good water again. But not, and the frogs were eliminated from the land, but not the mosquitoes or gnats. They became a new way of life for the Egyptians. They had to live under this judgment to the very same extent that their hearts were hard. And at this point we can see the magicians are beaten. They can't reproduce these mosquitoes by their own power. And the magicians are not sure, maybe, which surprised them more. The vast swarms of mosquitoes or the fact that they have no power to reproduce this magic at all. There are several features about this aspect of the magicians that, that are interesting. Firstly, notice that they ascribe this power to divinity. Now, our translations say this is the finger of God. And that's certainly one possible rendering, but it's just as possible to render it, this is the finger of a god, or this is the finger of the gods. So they may, they may not actually have been acknowledging the power of the one true God at this point. Well, whatever they believe, we know what Moses was getting at. Because it certainly is, in reality, the finger of the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This finger is pointing at the Egyptians, at the magicians, and at Pharaoh himself. It also points to us if our hearts are hard. The finger of God. That, of course, is a metaphorical expression. God does not have a body like men. But the finger of God makes its appearance later on in God's revelation. It occurs in the context of Luke. When the Lord is fighting against the principalities and powers of this dark world. This is what Luke 11 says. Now, he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. While others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So what does the finger of God mean in Scripture? It means that the kingdom and rule of God is coming to earth. And it casts out the rule of Satan and all the false gods that people love to worship. The finger of God is pointed toward the world. So it's a warning finger. It says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God is reigning over all the earth. And it is necessary to submit to that reign. That reign has come to this earth by and through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And Jesus made that plain when he said that whoever is not with Jesus is against him. <coughs> we also saw with the last two plagues, they have an echo in the book of Revelation. But always in Revelation, they are a bit louder more insistent, much more severe. Now, there isn't a particular echo of this plague in Revelation, but there are many things that are similar, things that talk about final judgment. Whenever we look at these plagues, we'll see that. The thing about the finger of God, though, is that it's pointed away from us now and towards Christ. 
You see, he came out from the dust of the earth and the resurrection from the dead. If you, will, if you want to say it this way, he's the real scarab, the real person who can go into the dust of the ground and come up on the other side, gloriously raised from the dead. He's the one in whom we put our trust. But you know, whenever we sin, it means that we're not trusting Jesus. We're putting our trust elsewhere. But God has a way of bringing us back from that when we are his true children. Have you ever noticed that when we sin knowingly against God, he often sends lots of little things that annoy us, but are actually things he's sending to get our attention. They're little gnats, if you will. But he is being gracious in so doing, isn't he? He could send something a lot bigger. But he sends the small stuff first in order to get our attention, calling us to repentance. They may not have any obvious connection with the sin committed. Now, we have to be careful here because we often experience lots of small, irritating things that may not be disciplinary in nature. They may be in other words, they may not be in direct result of our sin. They may be things just intended to teach us. Patience may not be connected with sin at all. But God often works this way when he is working to get rid of a particular sin in our lives. We can also ask this question of ourselves, what's the source of order in our lives? Some people believe that it's some kind of impersonal fate, like the Egyptians had in their concept of ma'at. Or some people think, well, I create meaning, I create order in my own life, sort of a postmodern way of thinking. The meaning in life is whatever I put into it, whatever I say it means. No, no, no such thing as truth that's true for everyone, except, of course, for that, for that statement itself. And they believe we each create our own story, our own narrative. Well, what happens when that story gets interrupted or disturbed, confused, or if it ends differently than what we want it to end? Isn't that a message from God then, saying that maybe we're not the captains of our souls and masters of our own fate? Isn't God telling us that Jesus is actually the answer? Isn't Jesus the one on the throne? Colossians 1 says, Jesus Christ is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the principle of order. He's much more than that, of course, but he's not less than that. It's not our own gifts. So is our life hidden with Christ in God? Is, is Christ the one who holds it all together for us? Is he the one who makes sense out of the chaos that occurs in our lives? Because without him, our lives are chaos. They're not order at all. One last thing we can learn here is the principle that God has more power than Satan. That's something that we know, but it's something that we forget. Why do we forget it? Because when we look at evil in the world, it tends to stare us in the face a lot closer. It tends to be right in front of us. It tends to blind us to everything else that's happening out there. We need to remember, they're not even on the same level of power. It's not a question that, it's not, it's not the case that God has just a little bit more power than Satan. They're not even on the same level of power. And that means that when Jesus is our Savior and our King, and we resist Satan, 
in the strength of Christ, Satan flees from us. He wants us to think that he has a lot more power than he actually has. But here we can see in the passage, the magicians, they are no longer allowed to try to counterfeit the power of God. There's an end to that sort of power. And it's only on the third plague. They're, they're, they're like out of the picture. They, they make one more appearance in the boils plague. Just to tell us, yeah, they're still around and they're still just as helpless as they were at, by the end of the third plague. That, of course, would be the final humiliation of them. But you know, when it comes to fighting Satan, that point uh, where it's easiest is the first point of temptation. That's when resistance needs to be the strongest, and when our dependence on Christ needs to be the greatest. See, if you allow that temptation to stew, it becomes much harder to resist. So that's, that's an encouragement then to us to pray at the very moment that the temptation comes. That's when we need to flee it the most. At that moment, we can pray that the same power that prevented these magicians from duplicating what Moses did through the power of God would protect us against the power of Satan that is seeking to overcome our resistance. The kingdom of God, the finger of God, is at work. He's bringing his kingdom to pass. He has overcome the power of the world. All of satanic powers are counterfeit. They seem more powerful when they're more visible, but they're not. God really does have the whole world in his hands. And in fact, he's a lot bigger than a scarab. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the word that you have given to us to point us to the king of the kingdom that triumphs over the satanic power. We thank you, Father, you have revealed just how limited Satan's power is. That he cannot be in the same league as you. That he cannot be your equal. And so, Father, we ask and pray that you will conquer Satan's power in our lives. That the temptations that come our way that you will show us the way of escape and that you will tell us and prompt us to flee by the power of the Holy Spirit that temptation the second it comes. And we pray, Father, that you will forgive us when we fall and put us on our feet again by your grace. We pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please turn with me to hymn number 372. Praise waits for thee in Zion, number 372.
God's blessing and benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.